This video is sponsored by Jackery. A few months back, I shared with you guys a project that could really only be described as a total emergency. Oh my God, Ashley. One of the walls of my shop has been leaking for probably 30 years, and it's due to a door that was improperly flashed, and it was just dumping water inside of the building. When we went to open up that wall, we discovered that the studs in it were so brittle that we could tear them out with our bare hands. In that video, we rebuilt the wall from the bottom up, but one thing that we didn't do was actually fix the leak. So we got it structurally sound, but it still leaks. The problem is that the door is really exposed where it is, up super high, there's not a big roof overhang, and the door was improperly flashed. I will fix the flashing issue in a later video, but for now I'm gonna fix the exposure issue by building an awning over the top of it. I figured now is the best time to build an awning because it's December in Seattle, it's still really rainy, it's still really snowy, and uh, this allows me to stay inside while I work on the majority of the project. So. Let's get started. If you recognize these four by four posts, I mean, I'd be surprised, but if you do, uh, they're from the original wall build. They're actually what I used to temporarily support both the landing and the ceiling while I was working on it. And when I started this project, I looked at them and they're honestly really nice, clear vertical grain fur, which does really well outside. So I decided to see what they looked like milled down. My table saw has a rip capacity of three inches, which is pretty standard, but these posts are three and a half inches by three and a half inches, so my blade doesn't cut all the way through them at its highest point. So I have to finish off the cut with a little bit of hand planing. So this might be a little bit confusing, so I'm gonna do my best to explain it. Um, Basically, I'm trying to keep the same reference face on the table saw. Uh, I noted that this was the, the reference face that was down on the table saw bed when I was pushing it through. And I was making sure to push, keep it down as opposed to like push it into the fence, which can kind of tilt it up. So I just ease it through. It helps to take a real light pass on it. And so now that I have this nice and flat, I'm going to flip it around, keeping this on the bottom running this side against the fence, which should be fairly square to the original cut, and then uh, pass this through. So these sides will be uh, hopefully parallel, and then I can rotate it over and start cutting these faces off. Now, it's not perfect, um, and you kind of have to slowly cut away at it to get it into square. The best thing would be to have a joiner, but I don't have a joiner in the shop, so this is the best I can do. It took a little bit of time to get through all six of these posts, but honestly, it was kind of enjoyable. I don't get a lot of time hand planing. I really enjoy it, and uh, this was a, an easy way to get some practice in. Now that I knew all the posts were square, I could then cut them to size. So two passes on the table saw so brought them in to that three inch mark that I was looking for. Next up, I need to clean up the ends of the posts and for that I'm gonna be using the Rockler Precision Miter Gauge. This is not only very precise, it also allows me to cut them directly on the bed of the table saw, which means that I get the full three inch depth of cut, which I need in order to cut all the way through. Now I'm not cutting these to length yet, I'm just squaring up the ends. I'll cut them to length after I've done the joinery and I'll explain why in a minute. So 
So these posts are going to form the brackets that support the weight of the awning. And they're gonna be basically like shelf brackets, but on a much larger scale. Since this is gonna take quite a bit of weight, I wanna make sure it's nice and strong. So I decided to go with a bridle joint, which not only looks good, but it also provides quite a bit of strength. I laid out all four posts with pencil lines so that I didn't get confused when I went to cut it on the table saw. Now I can use those pencil lines to set up my first cut, which is gonna be the shoulder cut. I clamped a stop block onto the side of my table saw fence. This prevents the workpiece from binding up as I push it through the saw. And I'm using the precision miter gauge once again to get a nice square cut. For the cheek cuts, I'm gonna need a different tool. This is a jig that I built for another project. It's called a tenoning jig. It's really simple to make. I do have plans for it on my website if you're interested. It's essentially four boards that are screwed together and it supports your workpiece as you pass it through. Now, accuracy isn't essential on this. You just wanna make sure and pass all of your tenons through at the same time because when you cut the mortise on the next piece, you'll cut it to match these pieces. Switching over to the opposing pieces, I'm gonna start cutting out those mortises. For that, I can continue using the tenoning jig. I can't really make a shoulder cut on this because it's a notch that's on the inside. And basically what I have to do is nibble it out because a dado stack is too short to go that full depth. What I do is I nibble out on one side and then I flip it over so it stays symmetrical on both sides. So I've intentionally undercut this joint because I want to sneak up on the fit. This is the essential part. This is where uh, most of the times I've messed this joint up, it's been right here. So I took my time, made multiple cuts, again, flipping back and forth on both sides to keep it symmetrical. I test fit the joint until it was just right. Now, ideally, I would have a sharp, flat-toothed blade to cut this with, and I wouldn't have to deal with cleanup on the top edge. Unfortunately, I didn't, so I ended up chiseling out the little grooves that are left by the table saw, and that allowed me to tighten up the joint a little bit more so that it would glue up without any seams. Now that the joints are fitting well, I can cut off that extra end bit. And the reason that I wait this long is that if I screwed up any of the joints, there's a slight chance that I'd actually be able to repair them. Not that I have personal experience messing up a joint and having to start all over from the beginning. With the bridle joints dialed in, I can start setting up for the braces. This is what the extra board is gonna be used for. And now you can see kind of how this bracket is going to look. I decided to keep things simple and set the braces at a 45 degree angle. And to get that angle right, I'm using this Shinwa Japanese miter square. I'll admit I bought this thing cause I thought it looked pretty and they're pretty inexpensive. They're like 20 bucks, um, but it's come in handy a lot more than expected. Shinwa is a brand that I keep going back to. I don't have any association with them, but this is one of their rulers. And I think it's super accurate and really nice to use with metric and imperial measurements. So I don't want to notch these all the way into the post because that would make the post a lot weaker. So I just notched them in one inch and then drew a line up to where it meets with the rest of the post. I think this will give it an elegant look and it's also going to provide a bearing surface so there's something for that brace to rest on. I set my table saw blade at 45 degrees and set the depth at one inch. Then I can use the miter gauge to cross cut all four of the posts. Now the next part of the cut could totally be done with a bandsaw, but I wanted to try my hand with hand tools. And so I started by knifing in all of the lines so that my saw would have something to follow. Before going too deep, I flipped it over to the other side and cut again. I'm glad that I did this because as you can see, my saw blade is drifting a little bit. It's really hard to capture that inside edge and uh, there's a little bit of an arc in the center of it because of that. 
but that's fine. I'm gonna be cleaning it up in the end anyway. I just wanna make sure that I don't cut too much. Eventually the Dozuki saw started to bottom out. So I switched over to a Royoba saw. This just doesn't have a back on it. So it's easier to kind of get into those places. Um, I also cut a relief cut because that arc was so significant that the saw was binding inside of the cut. So slowly but surely I worked my way through it and was able to trim this out. The more of these I did, the more experience I got. And that's kind of what I'm looking for with this project is just a little bit more hand tool experience. Off camera, I made a little test block so that I could test out the joint, see if there were any high spots in the center of it, keep checking it and rechecking it until it fit nice and flush. With all four notches cut out, I could start trimming up the braces. And for this, I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna be using a knife to cut in the edges. The only difference is I did decide to use the bandsaw on this one. I had enough time with the handsaw, but I still decided to do some of the cleanup with a hand tool. This is a Shinto rasp. I drew on the ends with some pencil just to make sure that I was sanding it away smoothly and I could see where the low spots were. I gave it a double check with the square and it was ready to go. To connect all these parts together permanently, I'm gonna use a couple different fastening methods. I'm going to be using screws, I'm gonna be using dowels, and I'm also going to be using epoxy. So these will be nice and strong when they're done. I'm also anticipating the holes that I need to make in order to mount it to the wall, because once this thing is assembled, I won't be able to get my drill press inside. I counterbore for the screw head, and then I drill all the way through so that the screw can go through cleanly and not get bound up. The ends of the bridle joints will be connected with dowels. So I'm gonna start by running the drill bit all the way through the joint without the tenoned piece inside. This is what's called a draw bore or an offset pinned tenon. Basically what I'm doing is I'm, I'm actually gonna drill this slightly out of center so that it actually draws this joint together. I can use the original drill bit to mark the center and then I use an awl to offset that center so that it's gonna pull it together. After that, it's just a matter of drilling through the tenon in the new location. The last thing to do before assembly is to cut off a little 45 degree edge on each corner of the brackets. While this may look decorative, and it kind of is, is also somewhat functional in that it allows the rain to drip away from the building a little bit easier. I'm excited to have Jackery sponsoring this video. Here in the Pacific Northwest, I spend a lot of time outside camping and exploring, and Jackery makes products designed for an outdoor lifestyle. I just got the Jackery Explorer 1000, which is a solar powered generator that allows me to bring power wherever I go. Last weekend, I took my Jackery out to the woods for a photo shoot. It's always handy to have extra power when you're setting up lights. When I got there, I realized that one of the lights that I brought actually turned on in the bag and the battery was completely drained. Fortunately, with the Explorer 1000, I could plug that light into the generator using a standard AC outlet. The lamp charged up within a couple minutes and I could keep going on with the shoot. Once I took a couple pictures, I reviewed that footage and out in this cold weather, device batteries don't last nearly as long, but Jack Regenerators have both AC and DC power built into them so I can charge my laptop, my cell phone, and my camera batteries all at the same time. The best part of all is Jack Regenerators can be recharged using solar power. They're easy to carry 100 watt solar panels, have built in handles and kickstands, so you can just lay them out and recharge your generator with the power of the sun. Jack Regenerators provide reliable power whether you are out in the woods or use them as backup when the electricity goes out. Visit jackery.com to explore their wide range of products. They make great gifts to share with your family for the holidays. Thanks, Jackery. 
now back to the build. Now that all the parts are made, it's time to assemble them and to glue them together. I'm using Total Boat High Performance Epoxy. This stuff is made for boats, which means it's great in wet weather. It also has a really large open time, which means that it's gonna dry slower so that I have plenty of time to assemble this before having to worry about anything. Not that anything ever goes wrong in a glue up. First one is glued up and it came together great. There was one moment of panic in that glue up and that was uh, when I attached these screws right here to the cross brace. When I drilled these out, I drilled them straight down and what I should have done was drill them at an angle um, because that's gonna pull the joint together. What was happening was it was actually sort of riding along this slope and as it tightened, it pulled the joint out. and. The most important part to engage is right here. That's what's gonna take the load and that was being pulled away. So I'm gonna re-drill these and then uh, glue this one together as well. As it's usually the case, the second one went smoother than the first one. And after waiting overnight for these to dry, I could then trim off the excess on the dowels and sand them up. After everything was sanded, I realized that I forgot to cover up the holes that were drilled out for the heads of the screws. So I quickly went back, cut some dowels on the bandsaw, glued them into place, and then trimmed them flush. These brackets were still pretty sharp from the milling, so I went over with some 120 grit sandpaper and broke all the edges. So I'll admit that I was planning on painting these, but the more I've been working on them, the more I like them. The Douglas fir just looks so good. So I'm actually gonna apply a water-based varnish. This is Halcyon Clear. I've got a full video on how to use this stuff. It's great, it's got a one hour dry time, so I can get, I need at least six coats on here. So I'll be able to get that done inside of a day. I'm also gonna be able to apply it to the uh, soffit trim. This stuff is uh, Douglas fir as well. And I'm just gonna apply it to the front and the back so it's fully protected for the seasons. Um, I will probably have to reapply this stuff after a year or two, um, but it's gonna look a lot better. And um, yeah, it's really nice. I like this stuff a lot. So let's get applying it because it's sunny outside and I need to get this hung while it's still sunny and, and nice because I don't like working in the rain. 
As I mentioned, I have a full video on how to apply Total Boat's Halcyon Clear or most water-based finishes for that matter. And I'll post a link right here if you're interested in learning more details. The basics is that I like to apply it with a foam roller, roller first, get three thick coats on, then sand with 320 grit, and then uh, the rest of the coats get applied with a brush. The first four coats are gloss, and then the last two I like to put on as satin. If you put the satin on first, it can start blushing and it looks terrible. So just make sure you start with the gloss before you apply any layers of satin. I had about an hour to wait in between each coat, so I decided to spend some of that time repairing this doorway. Some of this stuff was behind trim, some of it was behind some cover plates, and then other sections are actually rotted, and I need to repair these before I actually put the brackets into place. I started by cutting out this rotted section from the T111. This panel wasn't bad enough to replace the entire thing, but this section uh, was pretty rough. So what I did was I took some of the scrap left over from rebuilding the wall, and I cut out a corner. I then cut a 45 degree chamfer on the top edge of it and then used my oscillating multi-tool to cut the inside edge to the same angle that I did with the rotted piece. I covered the joint with high performance epoxy and then nailed it to the wall. There was a piece that was missing from uh, when I took the door frame off that was completely rotted out. So I replaced that piece as well, glued in the top edge with some epoxy and nailed it off. I figured since it was sunny, I might as well paint. And in order to do that, I wanted to dry out all the surfaces. So use the Jackery and heat gun to dry out everything that I could. And then went over the top of that with a primer. Some of you might be curious about the light fixture over my head. I actually have to remove that in order to get the awning on, and it will go back after I'm done with this process. Once the primer was dry, I went over it with a top coat, and to help the curing process, the sun was doing a pretty good job, but I just wanted to make 100% sure, so I used the Jackery again and a heat gun and just got it so that it was it was completely cured and I didn't have to worry about it. Got to be careful with the heat gun though, you can actually strip the paint if it's too hot. I know that I'm wearing the same clothes in this shot, but this is actually a couple of days later. I let the paint dry and I let the Halcyon Clear cure in the garage for a little bit just to make sure everything was about as dry as I could get before installing the posts. Speaking of installing, I use some Timberlock screws. These are structural screws, not your average screw. They actually have a sheer weight of 240 pounds inside of Doug fur. These are super long. They go into studs and there's three of them. So that's over what? 700 pounds that they can support. Needless to say, they are going to be plenty strong enough. A quick check for level, and then I was ready to start framing the roof. To match the pitch of the existing roof, which is a 9-12 pitch, I set my chop saw to 36 degrees. I'm making a couple of test rafters here out of two by fours. I'm gonna cut each end of the test rafters and then nail them together using a little cover plate out of scrap plywood. This will let me bring the rafters up to the brackets and draw out the bird's mouth joints that's gonna hold this thing securely to the brackets. First off, I make sure that it's nice and centered. And once it is, I take a scrap piece of plywood that I cut earlier to two inches and I can trace out the top and then align it with the side of the bracket and trace up. Now I'm tracing up on the inside edge of that and that'll give me the exact location of these joints. That makes sure that the entire structure will lower down by those two inches and sink into the brackets. I brought the rafters back into my shop and trimmed out those joints that I just marked out with the jigsaw. And then I could go back outside and check my fit.
Now you can see how awesome this joint is. It works really well, it nestles right in, and uh, it's gonna help keep everything square and aligned properly when I go to make the final rafter sections. Happy with the fit, I went back to the shop and tore these apart. I needed to add one more cut into these, which is gonna be for the central post. This will also be one of those three by three pieces. I milled it up along with the rest of the parts. It's made the same as the top of each bracket. It just doesn't have any joinery cut into it. Once done, that post will slot in here. It will help support the center and it'll look pretty nice too. The future project is still a new miter stand for my, my miter saw, uh, but for now I'm still <laughs> screwing in these, these stop blocks. I need to cut six of these. I, these are actually cedar. I had the cedar laying around. They probably don't have to be cedar, but it's a nice insurance policy that they're a little more rot resistant than your standard two by four. I ganged all six of them up and then traced out the joinery from the template piece that I made before. Rather than use a jigsaw, which is pretty inconsistent, I decided to use a circular saw to cut out at least one side of these bird's mouths. I set the depth of my saw and the angle of my saw to that 36 degrees and then could cut through. To finish off the cut, I went over to the bandsaw and trimmed them up. Now you can totally do this with a jigsaw. Probably most people on a job site would have a jigsaw, but the bandsaw is just a little bit more consistent and more square. I'm gonna be using those timber lock screws again to anchor this into place. So I pre-drilled for the screw heads and for the shank of the screw. Now I'm gonna kind of pre-assemble this roof just to make the installation easier. And for that, I'm gonna use the posts that I mentioned before and screw them together. Now I wasn't quite sure how to do this. This goes right into that corner and uh, I was having trouble with it pushing out. I couldn't get good clamping surface on it. So I came up with a better solution after doing this first one. Now I pre-drilled all the holes, but I also went through and countersunk a couple of deck screws into the peak of the roof. This is gonna pull that joint together a lot better, and then I can go back and screw in the timber lock screws, and it's just way easier. There we go. The first rafter is easy because it's going right against the wall, and I just attached it right at the end of that post. But the second and third rafters are gonna to need to be spaced evenly and inset a bit from the beam. So I started by just attaching them with those deck screws. This will allow me to move them up and down on that beam and place them correctly. It was at this time that I realized that I had forgotten to make the fascia board. And the reason I wanna make this this early on is because I actually have materials that I can trace out the shape of the fascia. The fascia is what's gonna go on the front of the roof and cover up all of this structure. And uh, as you can see, it's much easier now to lay it out by tracing on the actual rafter that's gonna be on the end that it's gonna to connect to. These pre-primed boards were a little bit wider than I needed, uh, but the next side down was too small. So I trimmed those to fit and then set them underneath the rafter assembly so that I could trace out where all the joints go. Then it was back over to the bandsaw to cut all the parts out. The trick that I like to use that's a very low math way of evenly spacing things is to basically lay out all your parts flat to the surface and then you measure up to your line and divide by however many spaces. In this case, it was only two spaces. So it was pretty easy math. And then I cut a bunch of two by fours to that size. I can use these to hold up the rafters while I'm installing them. For those of you interested in building this project yourself, there will be plans available on my website. I'm not sure if they're gonna make it out right when this video comes out, but they will be following soon after that. So make sure you check out my website, olmfab.com plans. And if they're not available yet, hop on the email list and I'll email you the instant they're ready to go.
Once the rafters were screwed on, I could tie in the ends with another bit of fascia. Now, I don't angle cut this fascia at all. I just left it square, but I want it to line up with the pitch of the roof so that front corner doesn't get in the way of the sheathing. And now it's the moment of truth to see if all that planning paid off and it slots into place. So obviously that is not uh, finished. <laughs> There's no roof, <coughs> but I'm sick. As you can tell, I'm very sick right now. And uh, it's currently 23 degrees outside and freezing rain is called for tomorrow. So I am going to lay low, enjoy the holiday. And then when I come back in January, I'll start in on the roof. Hopefully the weather will be better. I don't think it was the best idea to start this project in December. Anyway, thanks so much for watching. Thank you to Jackery for sponsoring this video. <clears throat> and thank you to my Patreon supporters as always. You guys are the best. Have a great holiday and I'll catch you on the next one.